Well, good uh, afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second in our series of lectures on the transits of Venus. Uh, I'm Ron Brashear. I am the head of special collections in the Smithsonian Institution Libraries, also the curator of that Chasing Venus exhibition that is over in the first floor west wing of this museum. The uh, exhibition was a lot of fun to put on. It opened at the end of March and will be running through April of 2005. So if you don't get a chance to see it, uh, or if you want to see it again, it'll be up for a little while. So we hope you can take some time to visit the Transit of Venus exhibition that we've got. The lecture series is funded by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Office of Space Science. So we're very thankful to them to have the opportunity to present the Transit of Venus lectures to the public, both here and later on the web. Now, uh, I think many of you know, may know by now, the Transit of Venus will happen on June 8, 2004, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. It hasn't happened since December of 1882, so we've been counting the days until that happens. But in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, we've got some lectures to stimulate your interest. And today, we've got uh, Richard Fisher with us. And Dr. Fisher, since 2002, has been the director of the Sun-Earth Connection Division of NASA's Office of Space Science. And what that means is that he has overall responsibility for developing policy and providing guidance for NASA's program to understand the physics of the variable sun and its influence on the heliosphere, solar system plasmas, the upper atmospheres and magnetospheres of planets, especially the Earth, one we're all interested in, and the origin of cosmic rays. I find it to be a nice coincidence that the third secretary of the Smithsonian, Samuel P. Langley, was also very interested in the Sun-Earth connection and hoped to predict our weather based on changes in the sun's activity. Turns out he would have had better luck uh, predicting the weather by monitoring changes in the stock market. But uh, science has improved a bit since 1900, so uh, things are looking up. Uh, now, Dick Fisher graduated with honors in mathematics from Grinnell College in 1961, received his PhD in astrogeophysics from the University of uh, Colorado in 1965. He's worked at the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy, the United States Air Force Sacramento Peak Observatory, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And in 1991, he joined NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where he was head of the solar physics branch. Uh, and among other things, payload scientist for the STS-87 space shuttle flight and chief of the laboratory for astronomy and solar physics. Now, he also gained an interest in Captain Cook and Cook's voyage back when he was at Hawaii in one of his first positions out of college. Now, of course, uh, Captain Cook perished in Hawaii. Uh, fortunately, this same fate did not befall uh, our speaker tonight. So um, he's here to talk to us about, in Endeavor's wake, the 1769 transit of Venus. Well, thank you very much for uh, letting me talk today. This is a tremendous uh, honor for me. Uh, as a young person, I had a job building and sighting telescopes uh, on the uh, uh, mountaintops of Hawaii. And uh, one of them, uh, on top of Mauna Kea, I used to look off to the west. And uh, you can't quite see it, but you, it's beyond another mountain. There's Kealakekua Bay which is where Cook met his end. And I used to sit up there and think about it, that you know, if you're an astronomer in Hawaii, you probably wanted to kind of mind your business carefully and not stay on the right side of folks. And I had a wonderful time there and uh, became very interested in weight and um, looking at uh, Cook's life and his sailing uh, exploits. And um, later, I became preoccupied with the idea that uh, many of the models we have for scientific exploration are based on that, um, on that voyage that he started in 1768. And I think that's uh, kind of ironic and interesting at the same time that many of the shuttles have been named after uh, Cook's ships, uh, Discovery and uh, Endeavor being two. And I always thought that uh, maybe if I had a good relaunchable spacecraft, maybe we ought to call it the Resolution. And um, you mentioned STS-87, and uh, in point of fact, like the Resolution, we lost that payload for a while and got it back and 
it was kind of interesting. Anyway, what I'm going to talk to you today is about is about a number of things. One of them is are just the factual things about the transit in uh, 1769. I'm also going to underline that that this is a model, this model of exploration, complete with its embedded issues of the tension between discovery and science is a theme which has played out over and over in history in uh, Darwin's uh, life with his captain Fitzroy also. So let me start. Um, the uh, beginning of the um, 17th century, science had, had taken some enormous steps and it was becoming clear that we were able to orient ourselves where we were in our solar system, what the nature of our solar system was, develop the mathematical tools that would allow us to predict allow humans to predict what was going to happen. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the first big events of practical astronomy was that a young man, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, which you may have heard about, came upon a scheme for predicting when Venus would pass between the, the Earth and the Sun. And he actually managed to do this. The hallmark of all good science is that you have a, a good prediction of something. And he was able in his own uh, observatory to see that that was so. He, he verified it. Well, Halley was uh, an important astronomer at the time. The quest was for longitude and how to navigate. And he realized that it was then possible to take a, an observation of Venus moving in front of the sun and to scale the solar system, to measure it in, in some unit that we know about. And uh, the unit that it, you would use would be the diameter of the Earth. But that's measurable in miles or meters or whatnot. And you could actually know something about how far planets and the sun was away. Uh, this became a kind of a, an international goal, uh, scaling the solar system. And um, there, I got to tell you, you have a wonderful, wonderful exhibition outside. I, there are things I didn't know about that the Divner Library has. And in it is Haley's article of, well, where he describes how, how you could use this and do it. It was a prediction that he made that there would be transients, uh, transits. And, and because of the resonance between Venus's orbit and the Earth's orbit, they occur in kind of a, an irregular pattern, but it's periodic, where there's a, an, there are eight years between a transit and then 120, 105 years, eight years, 121 and a half years. And so that means that only, only once per century do you have the opportunity of seeing uh, a good transit of Venus. Now, Haley died in uh, 1742 without ever seeing a transit, but he, he recognized the opportunity and he clearly gave a method for how to measure the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And he also did an error analysis and said, you should be able to set this to one part in 500, which is pretty precise. And this is, this is sort of the language of a transient, a transit. I, I keep saying transients because that's a different kind of uh, solar event. But a transit is when, when, the, when a planet passes between the Earth and the Sun. And the, the language of it is that when the, the edge of the planet, which is called the limb, touches the limb of the Sun, that's the first contact. And then second contact is when it's completely inside the, 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 um, the Sun's image. And third contact is where it just starts to leave. And fourth contact is where it's just left. And this is a, this is a terminology that goes on and on uh, with eclipses and uh, anything where there's an occultation, lunar, lunar occultations. So this is sort of conceptually what, what a, a transit looks like. Now, I'm not going to describe the process by which you make a measurement and uh, come up with a distance, but it involves kind of a straightforward idea. That if you were on one side of the Earth, let's take this, this observing position up here at the north, and you looked across the inter interplanetary space and saw Venus, you would see a spot on the sun behind it, and it would be, let's say, right there. Now, if you were on the other side of the Earth and took another, another look, you would look past that point and see a, a different spot on the sun. And this angle, this embedded angle in here, is called a parallax, and it's related to how far it is from the Earth to the sun or the Earth, any, any one of these dimensions. So by measuring the parallax, this, this difference of of angle from two points on the, on the Earth, you can, you can derive how far it is to the sun. Well, in a general configuration, uh, in the June 8th 
uh, transit. And you now, now you know that there is, is a good reason, and it's the frequency of, of the transits, that there is no human on the planet alive today who has seen the last one. That was, uh, my, my grandmother was born in, in, in 1881, the year before the last one that was visible. And um, uh, it's going to be in such a way that it, it goes across what we would think of the bottom part of the sun. Now, well, this is an astronomer talking. And, and if, you, if you project the, um, the fundamental coordinate systems of the solar system onto the sun, uh, the bottom is the south, is what that means, the southern, the southern hemisphere. And by convention, the, the, the sun rotates and the limb coming towards us is the east limb. So it's on the southeast limb, it starts and it goes across like this. And it takes uh, about the order of six hours to do that in this case. So the parallax that is measured will have to do with how much, how much jumping around this image has at any given time, depending on where you are on the Earth. Now, the issue for Haley and for Cook was that time is longitude. And if you know your longitude, you can set a clock. If you know what time it is, you can find your longitude. And so from the standpoint of navigation, uh, what one wants to do is know what time it is or know a fixed longitude. Well, this is a, a picture of, of Halley's observatory. It's uh, on, on the lower part of the Thames, uh, and you can visit it. There's a nice boat that goes down from uh, London Bridge. And this is a device which was used for setting clocks. Uh, it was used after Haley was, was the uh, superintendent there. And what they do is hoist a ball up to here and at one o'clock in the afternoon drop it. And if you were in the harbor, you could see that it dropped and you could set your clock. Well, at the time that Cook left, uh, the clock business was, was not so good. There were just a very few, in fact, there were only two navigating watches available. And um, Cook was a professional sailor. He was born uh, in, um, in 1728. I'm not quite sure what I knocked off of there. He was born in 1728. And this is a little remark that was made out of a biography that was published by the, uh, the Royal Society in 1805. And this is a portrait by Nathaniel Dance. And this is the one that Mrs. Cook always favored. There were other portraits, and she thought that he looked worn in one of them uh, that was done by uh, uh, an artist named Weber, which is thought to be the most accurate. And this is one that was, that was, that was painted between his first and his second voyage. He joined uh, the merchant fleet and operated on and was later the captain of a ship that carried coal from the north of England to London. And he was so interested that he took a demotion, in fact, to become enlisted crew on the king's ship. And he became a technical expert in navigation and did some uh, surveying and mapping of the coast of the New World uh, and, and was thought to be a, a, a principal in the application of astronomy towards navigation in the sense that he could do it either one of two ways. He could either have a clock and navigate or he could take observations of the moon and set his clock. And he kind of thought that an officer should be able to do either one. Um, it was very difficult. I'm told that it takes about a day and a half by hand to do the method of lunars. Uh, I have never tried it. I've tried navigating with a sextant and you don't want to sail with me because my errors are pretty big. Now, as a matter of national policy, after a voyage that touched on Tahiti uh, by a, a ship commander named Wallace a few years before uh, Cook started, the uh, Crown uh, decided that this was the opportunity to put British science in the forefront and that they would organize an expedition of exploration to Tahiti for the purpose of seeing the transit of Venus. And they uh, didn't particularly know what that meant. They had another naval officer named Green who had been at the Royal Observatory. And Green was obviously a candidate for being assigned to go with uh, Cook. And there was another dilettante. And I say that in the, not in the pejorative sense, but a, a polymath, a, a person with wide Catholic interest by the name of Joseph Banks, who was a rich young man. He was independent of means and his family had practiced in the grocery trade. And he had a passion for for, for natural history. 
and he offered to pay his own way and and to take with him a set of super cargo of artists and naturalists on this voyage of discovery to see what they could find now this is the theme that i'm really interested in in life which is the tension between formal exploration which is risk adverse and discovery and and the scientists of course don't know that there are any boundaries on anything nothing is forbidden try anything you know for goodness sakes well banks became the first professor of botany and uh, was a luminary in uh, British science from that time onward. And he and Cook became fast friends on the voyage. And this is what always happens, and I've seen this in my career, between the technical members of a shuttle crew and the professional flight officers, that, that once you're embedded in it, you can't tell. And they both go native the opposite direction, and it's one crew, and it's just great. I mean, common sense would tell you that would be the case. But, but sometimes people worry about this tension. And he personally enlarged the list of known plants as a result of this voyage by uh, about 10% of what was known at the time. There were about 10,000 plant species known. Now, Cook set sail in, 17, um, in 1768. It was kind of got a late start. any side of uh, Kealakakua Bay at the present time. Now, Cook was not like Banks. Cook was an explorer. And at the end of the second voyage, writing for posterity, what he said was, it was never my intent to sail further than any man could go, but to sail as far as I could go. And on his third voyage, uh, he stopped in Kealakakua Bay. And this is the, the map that they made at the time. Uh, this is a map that was drawn by uh, Bly, the, uh, the bounty captain. And Bly was kind of like a mission specialist. Uh, he was a sailing master and a technical uh, uh, cartography specialist with Cook's third voyage. And another uh, young lieutenant was George Vancouver, who came back to the coast of America twice after Cook in revolutionary times. Um, this is uh, Ka'aloa out here. And uh, the, the town that we were seeing in the previous picture is in here. And on the 13th of February, the night, sometime the night of the 13th of February, the cutter was stolen from uh, Discovery. It was on shore. Cook was outraged, and he had just enough of the thievery of, the, of, the Oceania, of Oceania. And this is a picture that was painted after the fact in England by an artist named Carver, Carter. And it's, it's dramatic and it's inaccurate, and it's thought by uh, professional historians to have one thing right, which is that this, which you probably can't see, this is a shotgun, double-barreled, and uh, Cook carried small shot on the left side and a ball on the right side, and he wanted the option of not killing somebody. If he had to use his weapon, he would use a shotgun. They went to get the, the cutter. They were met by a crew of people. The, the, uh, they'd worn out their welcome their first visit, They'd eaten all the food. They'd taken all the girls. They'd 
gotten every valuable thing in town and left. And they weren't just real welcome. And 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 there was a, this misunderstanding about whose cutter it was. And this is an accurate picture in that this is reputed to be Kalakaua, which uh, who was the king of the Hawaii. Uh, but of course, he was he was not even there. He was a long ways away. This is Weber's view. Weber was there the day after. And this actually looks like the place. Uh, and it has the right people. And this chap's name is Molesworthy Phillips. And he was a lieutenant in the Marines who who went over backwards in the scuffle. And it wasn't clear whether he was frightened or he was attacked, but he discharged his weapon. And at that point, the crowd became unruly and Cook lost his life. Uh, uh, Phillips, they managed to get back in the boat and was a survivor. Well, it was a tremendous voyage. The Cook uh, veterans were the most important explorers in the world, but there were many other observations of the transit of uh, of 1769. This is one that I thought was interesting, and I, I don't know its full story. This appeared in the uh, in the records of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. It was uh, the same transit, 1769, and and as my understanding went, that it was collected for Professor Rittenhouse, who was a professor at uh, I think I said Harvard, but it might be Yale. I might I may be on. I well. This is, a, this is a prospectus of the transit of uh, June 8th, and it's also plotted the one that's eight years later for, uh, uh, let's see, no, I'm sorry, this, yeah, this is, this is the one that occurs eight years later. And uh, so this is, this is what is expected to be seen. And um, I've, I've taken the trouble to bring along with me a one-page handout that has websites where these uh, technical descriptions are uh, available if you have interest in that. And this is what it will look like from the Earth. Um, the uh, transit takes place so that over central, uh, uh, sort of central Asia uh, on the coast of Africa is probably, probably about the time of day you'd want to be there. It's right at noon. Um, out in the Pacific, but not particularly visible from Tahiti, uh, the transit starts at sunrise, is in progress in sunrise, and that's what this line is. It, it's, it, when the sun comes up and you're on this side of it, it's going to be started already. And on this side of the line, it's going to it's going to be uh, uh, the transit will be in progress at sunrise. I just got these backwards: sunset here and sunrise here. And so, for uh, viewers in North America, uh, particularly along the East Coast, we'll be able to see a little bit early in the morning uh, on June 8th for maybe uh, about an hour. I think it's about 5:30 in the morning at uh, in uh, New York, and if we were fortunate, maybe we'd be able to see it here. I thought that I would try and bring to you uh, the experiences I've had with planetary transits. Um, it turns out that while there's a long period, 120 years or 105 years between uh, the long step between Venus transits, there are about 13 transits of Mercury a century. And there have been some since I've been practicing. And this is one from 2003. This was taken from a spacecraft that's located about a million, uh, a million miles from the Earth. It's called SOHO. And what it is is a multiple exposure. And this shows, uh, this is a data dropout. Uh, this shows um, the, uh, the uh, planet Mercury uh, about, every, uh, about every half hour, about every 15 minutes, I guess as it was uh, moving across the surface of the sun. We didn't use this for anything. This was just a picture that we used. We know how far it is to the sun, both from parallax and from, uh, from radar measurements. And this is another uh, satellite observation where it is kind of useful. We know how big, uh, this is like a scale. We know how big this is. It's, it's uh, about 10 arc seconds uh, in diameter. And this is the, the edge, the limb of the sun. And you can start to see what it looks like when the planet ingresses and egresses. This is ingress. And you don't see any hint of the black drop because um, uh, it's in space. And uh, uh, the, uh, this is in the far ultraviolet, and um, the planet's atmosphere is completely black at that point. And you can see a little bit of, of rim around it here. And what we have used this for is, by, is looking for a scale uh, on the upper atmosphere of the sun. This is made at uh, 6,000 degree temperature 
radiation, radiation that's, that's sort of typical temperature sun. This is much hotter, and, uh, and it shows a little layer above the sun called the chromosphere. And this is, the, this is at a million and a half degrees. And so these pictures have been useful for scaling, uh, for scaling the atmospheric features of the sun, uh, not particularly of, um, uh, of, of the planet Mercury, which doesn't have much of an atmosphere. And then this is a parallax measurement. Now, we took this one as a montage, and it's kind of complicated. Because the satellite is going north to south, from the North Pole to the South Pole, the, the viewing angle past the planet changes. And that's why this has a little sinusoidal wave in it. And this is when the planet is at the South Pole, and this is when, I mean, sorry, when the satellite was at the, at the South Pole of the Earth, and this is when it was the North Pole, and so forth and so on, through uh, several orbits. And uh, this is a, a, a self-calibrating picture. Since you know how big the, the planet is in arc seconds, um, you can measure the parallax by estimating it. And um, you, can make a, you can go backwards from this and uh, get the astronomical unit. We didn't do it that way for that reason, but that, that's sort of an interesting thing. So I, I tried to show you sort of what I, what I know about parallaxes, and uh, very interesting to me as an astronomer. This is a picture of Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Cook lived to be quite quite old. She outlived uh, six children. She was married for 16 years, four of which she was with her husband the rest of the time he was off to sea. Uh, she died in 1835 after the American Revolution, after there became uh, steam engines and steam ships. And uh, she, she went through the age of sail into the into a more modern era. It is said, and it's reported to me, uh, that she was uncomfortable at night when the wind blew for fear of the sailors who were still at sea, which I always thought was kind of a sweet thought. And this is uh, the reason that the folks were doing exploration then. It's the reason that in the business I'm in, we do exploration now. Uh, this is James Cook's uh, coat of arms, which was accorded to him. And his uh, comrade uh, Banks made sure that he uh, was given posthumously a medal from the Royal Society. And this is his coat of arms. And underneath it, it says, Nil intentatum reliquant, which uh, after a little struggle, I finally realized said he left nothing unattempted, which is probably true. And, and the, major, the major motto up here is circum orbis around the Earth. Well, it's pretty good for thinking about, about an agency, the space agency, that is, in fact, using Cook's model uh, or the Admiralty model of exploration and scientific discovery. Uh, we do still go around the Earth. And the reason we do it is for economic development, for marginal military advantage, for national pride and prestige, for new knowledge, and for adventure and a sense of achievement, somewhat similar to uh, Hillary saying, we climb Mount Everest because it is there. And um, uh, I, I have found it just fascinating to uh, be involved in, in sort of late age after having his interest in Cook to have a chance to sort of review this and what is now going to be a, a, obviously a national debate about how much exploration and how much discovery are we going to do, seeing as how it's very costly. So I've come to the end of my story. As a teacher once said to me, uh, my job today has been to talk to you, and your job has been to listen. And fortunately, we've gotten along so that we've finished at the same time, and we've gotten along <laughs> splendidly. So I want to thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to take any questions there, there might be about any of the things I've said or, or the things I've said that are wrong or whatever. <laughs> Sir. Well, uh, <clears throat> here's the short answer. I don't really know. Um, it, is, it is abundantly clear from the study done by a, a New Zealand historian of some fame, uh, uh, J.C. Beaglehole. And Beaglehole, I commend you to read. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it has done a history of, of Cook. And um, Green had an unhappy life. He, was, he thought he was slated to become the Astronomer Royal. And he'd worked for two of them, and he'd wound up in the Navy and sent to, sent to Tahiti as a subordinate to Cook. 
And he thought that there was a main chance for recovery of his career and opportunity for fame. And he was despondent after their rather meager results that they got on the transit of Venus. So it's unclear. He was in poor health to begin with, and then they were all sick later when they got to Java. And I don't know is the answer. There's the same kind of mystery about Cook's elder son who became a commander in the Navy and was lost in a boating accident, is the way it's usually said there. And it turned out he was on the way to his ship at night, and he made arrangements to be carried out by the people who were running the water taxi service. And they couldn't find them the next day. They found his body. He had a dreadful head wound, and it was thought that he was lost at sea while trying to get to his new ship, and he didn't have a coin left in his pockets. So there was kind of a euphemistic way of reporting things. I probably talked more about this than I have exceeded my knowledge, but that's my opinion. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, he had political pressure from the standpoint of – I'm sorry, sir. Oh, I certainly will. There was an observation that Cook went back to sea very rapidly, and the question was did he have political pressure on him to do that. And I was going to respond. I think he had two kinds of pressure. I think he had internal pressure. I think he was a man who was exactly right for exactly the right job at exactly the right time. And in any strategic sort of situation, you have to have three things. You have to have a noble goal, which he had internally, which was his exploration goal. You have to have a resource to attack, and the Admiralty was providing money and ships. And then you have to have the political will to carry it out. And Cook had a backer. It was the first lord of the Admiralty and the Earl of Sandwich, who he named the islands Hawaii, the Sandwich Islands, after his patron, who was a wealthy nobleman. And so I think there were both kinds of pressure. And there were an enormous number of voyages very rapidly between sort of 1745 and 1880. By 1880, the exploration had pretty well dampened out, and the exploitation of the Pacific, both from the standpoint of the development of Australia and colonialism, had sort of been undertaken. So it was a very rapid time. There was a lot of expansion. I'm not sure I answered your question, but I talked about it. Well, there is this issue of one of the reasons you do this is for national pride and prestige, pride being what we think about ourselves, prestige, what other people think about us. And that's still true today in the business I'm in. Space is actually an instrument of foreign policy, in my opinion. Sir. Well, I think that, okay, the question was, could I expand on the model of the Endeavour's voyage in 1769? I had alluded to the fact that we use that as a model for exploration today. I think my thought is that you can see that most clearly in the lunar expeditions, that they initially sent flyers, professional aviators, who were trained in space operations. But by the end of the program, had had a policy of selecting scientist astronauts, Senator Schmidt being one. There were other people who wanted to be involved, who were professional scientists, who would use and exploit the opportunity of a special viewpoint solely for the discovery and communication of new knowledge. 
and i think you can see that operating pretty well even right now the chief scientist of nasa john's grunsfeld is a is a mission spatialist astronaut who is actually had his hands on and repaired the hubble telescope so that it isn't just good enough in our view as a society i'm i'm uh, let me put this to you as a hypothesis. It's not good enough to go and get a picture of the footprints and a picture of the flag. But it has to be some more achievement than that. There has to be some intellectual, cultural, possibly economic, possibly political advantage to doing this. Otherwise, it doesn't sit very well with our ideas about government, where you take public money and you have, you have governmental achievement, sort of a, a utilitarian approach. I think it's just fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm the beneficiary. You, you wouldn't believe the things I've done. And I, I thought it was a boy that it was all Buck Rogers. And uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I can hardly, I can hardly see straight. Thank you for paying your taxes. <laughs>